Welcome everybody to my incredibly timely Kingdom Hearts story summary. The Remind DLC for Kingdom Hearts 3 is finally here, and I know that there are at least a few of you out there who, like me, haven't actually played Kingdom Hearts 3 yet. And if you are one of those people, I'll bet you could use a quick summary of the series plot before diving in. Or maybe you played this game a year ago like everybody else did, and you just want to watch a newbie stumble through this like a late idiot. In either case, I'm here to help. Now, has literally every other YouTube channel already made a video like this? Yes. Is mine going to be better than theirs? Eh. Is there any point to me doing this at all? Anyway, let's begin. Let me start by just laying down a few fundamentals so I don't have to stop and explain it later. 1. This story features an ongoing battle between light and darkness, which are two literal and opposing forces in this universe. Characters wield light or darkness to do magical things, a balance of each exists within everybody's hearts. It's not exactly like the light and dark sides of the Force, but it is basically that. 2. Kingdom Hearts, the thing which this series is named after, is the most abstract, difficult to explain concept in this entire thing, which is saying something. Kingdom Hearts is the heart of all worlds, a source of ultimate power and wisdom. Even the characters in the story don't seem to have any idea what it actually is or what it does. All they know is that they either want it or they want to protect it. 3. Characters in this universe tend to wield these magical weapons called Keyblades. They are basically just swords, but they can do all sorts of plot-relevant magical things. 4. And this one's important. In this universe, a person is made up of three things. A heart, a soul, and a body. The heart is like the core of your being. It's your emotions, your memories, your ambitions. It's what makes you who you are. The soul is basically the thing that makes you alive, and the body is the vessel that those other two inhabit. And the reason this matters is that it is possible to separate hearts from bodies without killing that person. Hearts can be extracted from bodies and continue existence separately as an entirely new character. Hearts and bodies can be reunited, restoring the character that existed before. The heart from one person can temporarily take refuge in the heart or body of another person. All kinds of wild stuff can happen. Honestly, the biggest reason that this lore can be so difficult to follow is that you not only have to keep track of what all of these characters are doing, but you frequently have to keep track of what all of their component parts are doing also. It's a lot, but I am going to try to make this understandable. I may have to skip out on a lot of details and side stories to do it, but by gosh, I'm going to try. So let's just do this in chronological order, starting with the events laid out in Kingdom Hearts Key, Back Cover, and Union Cross. Enjoy! Once upon a time, in the age of fairy tales, all of the worlds were connected under the light of Kingdom Hearts. In a place called Daybreak Town, an organization of Keyblade wielders existed to defend this light. One day, the leader of these wielders, the Master of Masters, as he was known, gathered his apprentices together. There was a devastating war coming, he said, one which threatened to destroy the light and leave the world in darkness. To five of his apprentices, the Foretellers, the Master gave a copy of his Book of Prophecies, assigned them each a specific role to play in the coming trials, and commanded them to form unions comprised of other Keyblade wielders. But for his sixth apprentice, Lushu, the Master had a different assignment. He gave Lushu a mysterious box and a Keyblade containing his eye, instructing Lushu to pass this Keyblade on generation to generation so that the Master might witness the future through it. Then the Master disappeared. The Foretellers strove to carry out the Master's instructions, but when evidence suggested that there was a traitor in their midst, tensions escalated quickly, and the Foretellers succumbed to infighting. Seeing that this impending Keyblade War was inevitable, one of these Foretellers, Ava, dutifully performed her given role and formed another secret organization of Keyblade wielders called the Dandelions, a group whose job it would be not to fight in the coming war, but to escape and survive it. The Keyblade War did indeed come to pass. The five unions clashed and destroyed themselves. And Lushu, having now witnessed these events as instructed, took the box and his master's eye and departed. Just as the master had foretold, darkness spread, and Kingdom Hearts was seemingly lost. But in the end, the universe was saved from this calamity, thanks to the light found in the hearts of small children. But now, all of the worlds were separate from each other, tiny glimmers of light in a sea of darkness. 
The Keyblade armies of Daybreak Town may have been lost in the war, but Ava's Dandelions survived, whisked away to the Realm of Sleep. There they organized under new leaders, Ephemer, Skuld, Ventus, Brain, and Lorium. These five had been selected by the Master in advance, or at least four of them had. One of these was an imposter, and the murderer of the originally chosen fifth leader, Strelitzia. But at this point we are caught up to all of the Kingdom Hearts Union Cross stories that had been released when Kingdom Hearts 3 came out, so I guess let's skip ahead, huh? There was once a boy, living in a place called the Destiny Islands, who looked out to the horizon and wanted something more. That boy's name was Xehanort, and he would eventually leave those islands and train to become a Keyblade Master, joining an order of Keyblade wielders who braved the spaces between the now fragmented worlds, fighting to protect the light that remained. Xehanort fought alongside them for a time, eventually getting his hands on a rather familiar looking Keyblade. But as Xehanort traveled and studied, he came to be obsessed with the nature of Kingdom Hearts and light and especially the darkness which his fellow Keyblade Masters seemed to fear so much. He eventually came to believe that light and darkness were meant to exist in a balance, a balance which the Keyblade wielders were disrupting with their tyranny of light. And so he resolved to restore that balance. If he could somehow obtain the legendary weapon known as the Keyblade, I know it's a really bad name, just roll with it, a weapon capable of unlocking Kingdom Hearts, he might be able to instigate a new Keyblade War, bringing about a new apocalypse to make room for a more pure, balanced universe of his own design. According to his research, the Keyblade he sought had once existed alongside and protected Kingdom Hearts during the Age of Fairy Tales, but had been shattered in the aftermath of the Keyblade War, splintering into 20 shards, 7 of light and 13 of darkness. Gathering those 20 missing pieces together would make it possible to reforge the blade. But such a task would take many, many years to accomplish, and by this point Xehanort was already a very old man. If he was to have any hope of success, he would need some way to extend his life. So, Xehanort took on a young apprentice named Ventus. Yes, in fact, the same Ventus. I, I think. It's Kingdom Hearts, I don't know, man. He hoped to make this boy into a new, younger vessel for his heart and years of acquired knowledge. Unfortunately, Ventus proved a poor candidate, unwilling to embrace the darkness inside himself. So Xehanort decided to use this weakling for a different purpose. He had heard of another way that it might be possible to restore the Keyblade. The legendary weapon could be recreated if two hearts of equal power intersected, one of pure light and one of pure darkness. So Xehanort forcefully extracted the darkness from Ventus's heart, creating a being of pure darkness named Venetus, and leaving Ventus with a heart of pure light. But here too Ventus proved inadequate. The extraction process left his heart fractured and weak, the light inside him slowly fading away. Seeing that the boy wasn't going to make it, Xehanort decided to do Ventus a kindness and let him spend his final moments in the calm of Destiny Islands. And Ventus's story would have ended right here, were it not for a newborn boy named Sora. Sora's young heart encountered Ventus's fractured one and helped to mend it, forging a lasting connection between the two. Xehanort was surprised indeed to see Ventus suddenly revived. The boy was still weak though, nowhere near a match for Venetus in his current state. So Xehanort decided to leave Ventus in the care of his old brother-in-arms, a Keyblade master named Ericus. Over time, Ericus's training would surely make this boy stronger. Xehanort's key blade would be forged yet. It was just a matter of time. And this brings us to the events of Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Four years have passed, and Xehanort's moment has nearly arrived. Ventus's time spent training under Ericus has paid off. He's nearly strong enough to challenge Venetus now. And Ericus's other two pupils, Aqua and Terra, are to undergo their Mark of Mastery exam. Terra in particular has caught Xehanort's interest. The boy is strong and susceptible to darkness. A perfect vessel candidate. But first Xehanort needs to separate the students from their master, so he sends Vanitas out to various worlds to spread these negativity monsters called Unversed everywhere. Then Xehanort attends the Mark of Mastery exam and sabotages it, causing Terra to fail. Ericus dispatches Terra and Aqua to deal with the unversed problem, and Vanitas goads Ventus into following after them. 
Once the students are isolated, Xehanort sets to work manipulating the extremely easily manipulated Terra, planting seeds of doubt in the boy's mind, cultivating the darkness in his heart. On a world known as Radiant Garden, Xehanort enlists the help of a resident named Brague to push Terra into finally wielding the darkness willingly. Xehanort even manages to trick Terra into helping him strike down Ericus. Eventually, once all of the pieces are in place, Xehanort lures the kids out for a showdown at the Keyblade Graveyard, the desolate site of the original Keyblade War. Xehanort possesses Terra, finally acquiring a younger vessel in which to continue his work. Venetus clashes with Ventus and briefly succeeds in fusing with him. For a moment, it appears that Xehanort's plan has succeeded, but then it doesn't. Terra fights Xehanort's possession through sheer will, and Ventus manages to reject the fusion, destroying Venetus from within and shattering the incomplete Keyblade they had nearly formed together. But the cost of this victory is high. When the dust settles, Terranort is nowhere to be found, and Ventus is left comatose, his heart fractured once more. Aqua carries Ventus back to the world that was once their home, now destroyed by Xehanort. Following her defeated master's instructions, she reforms this broken world into a labyrinthine castle, Castle Oblivion, and she hides Ventus's body inside so that he'll be safe until she can figure out how to wake him. Fortunately, Ventus's absolutely wrecked heart has found refuge once more in the heart of young Sora, the little champ. But that still leaves the matter of Terranort. Aqua finds her possessed friend washed up in Radiant Garden for some reason and confronts him. Unfortunately, in the aftermath of their fight, Terranort begins to fall into the Realm of Darkness. Aqua dives in after and sacrifices herself to save him, hurtling her friend's body back toward the light. Aqua is left to wander the Realm of Darkness alone. And there she will remain for pretty much the rest of this summary. We will get back to her, but until then just assume that while everything else is happening topside, she is still wandering around down there and getting more and more bummed out. Okay? Okay. So at this point, even though Terra is still fighting like heck from within, and Master Ericus's heart is also in the mix helping him, I guess, whatever, Xehanort has pretty much assumed full control of Terra's body. Break finds that body unconscious in Radiant Garden and informs the world's king, who is known as Ansem the Wise. When Ansem arrives, he finds that this mysterious young man calls himself Xehanort, but can't seem to remember anything about himself. So the king decides to care for the poor fellow and take him in as a pupil. See, Ansem the Wise is a scientist who is fascinated by the nature of the heart, and Xehanort proves to be an exceptionally talented apprentice, not surprisingly. He even volunteers to be a test subject for some of Ansem's experiments, which Ansem agrees to in hopes that it might help to unlock some of the young man's lost memories. And unfortunately, it does. Xehanort starts to remember what he was up to before this little amnesia spell interrupted things, and he starts putting old plans back into motion. So. Actually, let me pause this for a second because we need to address something. One thing that you just kind of have to accept in order for any Kingdom Hearts lore to work is that Xehanort is functionally omniscient. He can predict what everybody else is going to do down to the last detail. He can predict every little event that will play out years in advance. He knows exactly where and how his perfect plans will fail, and his backup plans always seem to account for the specifics of those failures. Because he's apparently brilliant enough to foresee all things and put several massively complex schemes into motion simultaneously, he's just not brilliant enough to make any of those schemes actually succeed. Making Xehanort impossibly foresightful is Nomura's favorite method of brute fix forcing continuity problems in this plot spaghetti, so let's just accept that and move on. Okay? Okay. So, back to Xehanort's plan. The Ventus Venetus scheme for recreating the Keyblade had turned out to be a bust, but that whole intersect a heart of pure light and pure darkness idea had always been a bit of a shortcut to try and skip past the much more difficult work of finding and gathering those 20 Keyblade shards. But that's okay, because Xehanort had foreseen the possibility of this Ventus hack not working out, and just in case had been working on a long-term backup plan in parallel the whole time. See, it turns out that the seven shards of pure light had now taken the form of hearts, the pure hearts of seven princesses scattered across the various worlds. So while Xehanort had been world hopping around manipulating Terra, he had also made a stop in Enchanted Dominion and contacted a sorceress there named Maleficent. He had told her of the existence of other worlds out there, and of the princesses of heart. 
he had planted ambitions of power in her mind, manipulating her into beginning a universe-wide search for those princesses. He could collect those hearts himself later once she'd gathered them all in one place. As for the 13 shards of darkness, that would be trickier. He'd never been able to figure out where those had ended up. But if the seven shards of light could take the form of hearts, why not the 13 of darkness? It could work. So this is now Xehanort's Keyblade recreation plan, and it so happens that he's in a very good position to move that plan forward. Together with Ansem's other apprentices, Xehanort begins conducting his own experiments under Ansem's nose, performing tests on Radiant Garden citizens, turning them into Heartless, building an army of Heartless in the castle's depths. When King Ansem learns of all this and tries to put a stop to it, the apprentices take over, banishing the king to the Realm of Darkness and continuing their work under Xehanort's leadership. They pursue the darkness together and, in the end, are consumed by it. Now remember what I said at the beginning, life in Kingdom Hearts is made up of a heart, a soul, and a body. And when someone's heart is lost to darkness in this universe, that corrupted heart leaves the body and transforms into a shadow, a manifestation of darkness known as a Heartless. Not a great name in retrospect, but here we are. These Heartless seek to consume not only the hearts of those around them, adding even more shadows to their numbers, but also the hearts of the worlds they inhabit. But, as you will recall, just because the heart is lost doesn't mean the person's body and soul just vanish. Instead, the husk left behind continues existence in a new form, known as a nobody, an empty being existing in neither light nor darkness. And in the case of a particularly strong-willed individual, that nobody might even be able to retain a semblance of their original form. So. All of Ansem's apprentices lose their hearts to darkness and become nobodies. Xehanort separates his own heart from his body as well, splitting himself into two beings. His nobody takes the name Xemnas, and forms a group called Organization 13 together with the nobodies of his fellow apprentices. Xehanort's Heartless, just to make things more confusing, adopts the name of Radiant Garden's former king. Now, be warned, we are about to dive into some heavily retconned territory, and a lot of it isn't going to seem super relevant to what Xehanort is scheming, so just try to keep in mind as we go forward, these two clowns are split-off incarnations of this guy, who is actually this guy. And this guy's ultimate plan is to gather seven lights and thirteen darknesses so he can reforge the Keyblade and use it to access Kingdom Hearts and destroy everything. It's not 100% clear how well these two splinters remember that master plan, but they do each want to get at Kingdom Hearts real bad, and their independent efforts will ultimately serve that master plan intentionally or not, because Triple Galaxy Brain over here is just so good at predicting things. Okay? Okay. So, this imposter Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, who I'm just going to call Xehanort's Heartless from here on because this is confusing enough, gathers all the Heartless under his command and prepares to launch an assault upon all the worlds of the universe in pursuit of Kingdom Hearts. To access it, he will need to gather seven Princesses of Heart, hey, remember those? And a Keyblade wielder, one with the power to open and close the doors protecting the Hearts of Worlds. To gather the seven princesses of heart, Xehanort's Heartless teams up with Maleficent again, who has been running that fetch quest in the background this whole time. Getting a Keyblade wielder is gonna be a little bit trickier though, because there aren't exactly an abundance of them running around willy-nilly and alive anymore. So, in order to find one, Xehanort's Heartless selects a special girl from Radiant Garden, Kyrie, and sends her out into the universe, hoping that her pure heart will resonate with that of the Keyblade wielder. And thanks to a little bit of protection magic Aqua just so happened to give this girl back in the day, Kairi winds up on the Destiny Islands and befriends two boys, Riku and our good little buddy Sora. This brings us to the events of Kingdom Hearts. Xehanort's Heartless tracks down Kairi and sends in the Heartless. Sora is suddenly granted a Keyblade to fight them. Kairi mysteriously vanishes into Sora, which is going to be very important later, and Riku embraces the darkness in hopes of exploring other worlds like he's always wanted to. The islands are consumed by the Heartless, and everybody is scattered. Sora winds up in a transitory world called Traverse Town, where he meets a handful of Radiant Garden refugees, as well as Donald and Goofy, King Mickey's right-hand men. The king had apparently run off to try to figure out why worlds were suddenly disappearing, and left Donald and Goofy with orders to find the Keyblade Master. And so our heroes travel together from world to world, fighting Heartless, locking the doors to various worlds' hearts so the Heartless can't take them, and trying to find Riku, Kairi, and the king. 
Riku, meanwhile, winds up in Hollow Bastion, the broken husk that remains of Radiant Garden. There, he meets and immediately teams up with Maleficent, agreeing to help her gather Princesses of Heart in exchange for her help finding Kairi. And he does manage to find Kairi, but it seems that she's lost her heart and gone comatose. Everything comes to a head when Sora reaches Hollow Bastion. Riku gives fully into darkness and is possessed by Xehanort's Heartless. While confronting his possessed friend, Sora learns that not only is Kairi one of these princesses of heart, but her heart has actually been trapped inside him, basically piggybacking inside his own heart ever since their island was destroyed. So, being the wonderful little boy he is, Sora uses a keyblade to unlock his own heart and release Kairi's from its prison. Kairi awakens just as Sora turns into a heartless. Fortunately, she is able to call his heart back from darkness to save him, for some reason, I don't know why it works this way, just don't worry about it. This moment has enormous ramifications, which we are going to come back to in a moment. Anyway, Sora, Donald, and Goofy pursue Xehanort's Heartless to the end of all worlds, defeat him, and then close the door to darkness with Riku and King Mickey's help, which unfortunately leaves Riku and Mickey trapped on the other side. Most of the worlds lost to darkness are revived, everyone gets sent back to their home worlds, Kairi gets thrown back to the Destiny Islands, and Sora, Donald, and Goofy find themselves out in the middle of nowhere. This is where the story splits into a couple of different threads, and the reason for that is this moment. When Sora does this, a lot happens. Like I said, when a heart is consumed by darkness, a heartless is created, but so is a nobody. So when Sora became a heartless, even for those brief minutes, that event gave birth to a nobody. A completely new being who awakes in a place called Twilight Town with no memory and no understanding of what he is. This nobody is found by Xemnas, given the name Roxas, and recruited into Organization 13. Oh, but we are just getting started, because apparently Sora having Kairi's heart inside him at the moment of this noble sacrifice complicates things further. In addition to creating a Sora nobody, this moment also created a Kairi nobody named Namine. And Namine's a very weird case, because she was born of Kairi's heart, but Sora's soul and body, so congratulations 12 year olds, your hearts basically had a kid. Anyway, let's talk about Organization 13. As a group of nobodies led by Xemnas, the organization's objective is, ostensibly, to restore the hearts they've lost. And they plan to do this by creating their own kingdom hearts. Because yes, in addition to being the huge, unknowable power at the center of the universe, kingdom heartses are apparently things you can just sort of artificially create. And there are multiple ways to do so. Nomura, I've read your story and I have some notes. Anyway, once a heartless is defeated, the corrupted heart is set free. So the organization's plan is to free as many hearts as possible, and then gather them into one place until a Kingdom Hearts forms. But you can't truly free a corrupted heart with just any old weapon. Apparently only Keyblades can do that. Convenient, then, that a Keyblade wielder just accidentally created a Keyblade wielding nobody. So Roxas, now that he has been inducted into Organization 13, is immediately given the task of defeating as many dang heartless as he can. But he barely has time to settle into his new life when half of the members of the organization are sent off on a secret mission. Because that's right, it's time for Chain of Memories! Let's jump back to the boys for a minute. While seeking Riku and the King, Sora, Donald, and Goofy are lured into a mysterious place called Castle Oblivion by members of Organization 13. Hey, we know that place! But the further our heroes venture into this castle, the more of their memories they begin to lose. Eventually, Sora even starts to forget Kairi, instead remembering another girl he grew up with on the islands named Namine. And it turns out that Namine is in that castle, but as you and I well know, she is not a girl from Sora's childhood. What's more, due to the bizarre circumstances of her creation, Namine has the power to manipulate the memories of Sora and people close to him. She's been the one tampering with Sora's memories ever since he entered the castle, under orders from her captors, Organization 13. Six Organization members were sent to Castle Oblivion to intercept Sora. Marluxia, Larxene, Vexen, Lexius, Zexion, and Axel. But Marluxia and Larxene have some secret plans of their own. Their hope is that they can use Namine's powers to try to control Sora themselves, and use him to take over the organization. Unfortunately for them, organization leadership has already caught wind of their schemes, and given Axel orders to play double agent and eliminate any traitors he can sniff out. 
Meanwhile, Riku is also in Castle Oblivion for some reason, awakened there mysteriously after helping to close the door to darkness. He too has been making his way through the castle with the help of King Mickey and a mysterious shrouded figure named Diz, confronting organization members and wrestling with the lingering darkness within him. There's also this weird replica of Riku running around for some reason. Not super important right now, but just keep it in mind, we're gonna come back to this replica thing in a minute. Anyway, when the dust settles, Axel is the only member of the organization to leave the castle alive, having successfully disrupted the traitor's plans. Riku comes to terms with the blend of light and darkness within himself, fights off Xehanort's influence, dons one of the organization cloaks so he can traverse the darkness safely, and leaves the castle together with King Mickey and Diz. Then there's Sora. Sora finally reaches Naminé and learns the truth about her. She apologizes for tampering with his memories and offers to restore them. Unfortunately, it's gonna take a long time to complete that process, and he's not gonna remember anything that happened in Castle Oblivion when she's done. So he goes to sleep in an egg thing, and Naminé goes to work. Diz and Riku eventually join up with her and try to support her efforts. All right, back to Roxas. As Roxas settles into his new Organization 13 life of doing daily missions, he soon befriends two other members of the organization, Axel and their mysterious newest initiate, Shion. But Shion isn't just another nobody. Nope, it turns out she is yet another product of this. You see, back before Axel snuffed him out, Vexen here had a little pet project creating puppet replicas. He was the one responsible for creating that Riku replica that Sora encountered in Castle Oblivion, and he was also responsible for creating Shion here. Shion is a replica of Roxas infused with some of the stray memories Naminé had ripped from Sora. She is ultimately the organization's backup plan in case Sora doesn't cooperate and Roxas doesn't work out. What's more, because Shion is unwittingly siphoning Sora's stray memories, her very existence is interfering with Naminé's restoration process. So long as Shion holds those memories, Sora cannot be resuscitated. Upon learning this, Diz sends Riku in to handle it. Riku confronts Shion about the matter, and as she slowly comes to realize what she is and what the organization intended for her, she eventually chooses to give herself up and reunite with Sora, fleeing the organization and forcing Roxas into a lethal confrontation. Furious over the way he and Shion have been used, Roxas sets out to honor her last wishes and disrupt the organization's plans. Unfortunately, Naminé also needs Roxas's cooperation to complete her work on Sora, so Riku comes a-calling. The two boys fight, Riku embraces his own darkness and wins at the cost of a hot new summer look, and Roxas is captured. Diz drops Roxas into a virtual Twilight Town so Naminé can finally finish her work on Sora uninterrupted, and everything is sad. This brings us to Kingdom Hearts 2! Oh, there's so much left. So Roxas is living a chill summer vacation life in this simulation with no memory of what happened prior to his capture. But as Sora's restoration nears completion, and as organization members try to hack in, the simulation starts getting screwy and Roxas struggles to maintain his grasp on reality. Eventually, Naminé, Diz, and Riku manage to coerce him into finally re-merging with Sora, allowing our boy here to finally wake the F up and reunite with his cartoon friends. The crew is given a briefing on the Organization 13 situation by King Mickey's old mentor, Yen Sid. Sora finally gets a change of clothes and they embark on a new adventure, traveling to Disney Worlds, restoring Radiant Garden to some semblance of its former glory, snuffing out a few more Organization members, mourning lost friends, reuniting immediately with lost friends, participating in sea musicals, saving Santa, Kingdom Hearts things and the organization keeps prodding Sora along. At this point, they've lost their two Keyblade wielders, so the new plan is just to use Sora to collect the hearts they need. Every heartless Sora defeats brings him closer to the organization, but also furthers their plans. Axel, meanwhile, has gone rogue and pops in from time to time trying to push Sora toward darkness in hopes of just getting his nobody friend back. He even kidnaps Kairi for this plan, but it's okay because it forces the story to stop completely ignoring her. Also, Maleficent is back and acting on her own, and Pete is her new muscle, which is just the best. Eventually, our boys are ready to take the fight to the organization where they live, their headquarters, the world that never was. 
As the crew storms the castle, Diz finally reveals his true identity and attempts to sabotage the organization's near-complete Kingdom Hearts by converting the hearts into data, which I am sure sounded like a better idea in his head. Also, Sora, Riku, and Kairi are finally reunited. Riku still looks different, but then he stops, and that's nice. Sora and Kairi learn about their nobody children, and they all have a touching reunion. Then they clean up the last few organization members, Sora and Riku defeat Xemnas, and after spending a few minutes trapped in the World of Darkness, the lot of them return home to the Destiny Islands where they can finally rest, catch up on their lost childhoods, and peacefully live out I am of course kidding. There are still two games left. It's time for Kingdom Hearts Coded. We are gonna make it through this, you and I. So King Mickey, Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy Cricket, who I think I failed to mention completely up until this point, sorry, return to Disney Castle. You see, Jiminy's been tagging along with the boys this entire time, and he's been trying to chronicle their journeys in a collection of journals. But when Jiminy goes back through them, he spots an entry that he didn't write. To investigate this mystery, Mickey digitizes the journals, creates a digital world inside them, and sends a digital version of Sora, Data Sora, if you will, to find the cause. So on Data Sora goes, fixing bugs in the datascape and pursuing a mysterious cloaked figure. Unfortunately, Mickey and the rest soon find themselves absorbed into and trapped in the digital world they created, and they are greeted there by a personification of Jiminy's journal, the mysterious cloaked figure. <sighs> Data Riku. Together, the lot of them try to troubleshoot whatever the heck is wrong with this dang journal. Eventually, as Data Sora dives deeper into this datascape, into scenes and places that even he doesn't remember, confronting yet another mysterious hooded figure, he begins to feel a sadness for the things and the people he feels like he should know but can't remember. This is by design, it turns out. This page in the journal was specifically engineered to help Sora come to terms with hurt to wrestle with the pain that all of the separate parts of him experienced individually before becoming part of him again. Once he succeeds in accepting that hurt, Data Sora finally reaches Data Namine, who tells him that the bugs in this journal are a side effect of her memory tampering, and that Sora's connections to Roxas and Shion and Axel and Ventus and all these different characters have made him the key to, like, everything. Data Sora reports back. Mickey delivers this news to Yen Sid. Yen Sid drops the knowledge that, by the way, if a heartless and a nobody get defeated, the original being comes back to life. So we should probably get to battle stations and make the new kids take a test. That's right, Xehanort's back in the picture, baby. And it turns out so are all the defeated Organization 13 members. Hooray! Now strap in, because things are about to get dumb. So, Sora and Riku head back to Yen Sid's tower and prepare to undergo their own Mark of Mastery exam, the test that will decide whether they are truly ready for the title of Keyblade Masters. Kinda seems like an unnecessary formality, given everything they've already achieved, but okay. And apparently, whoever is administering the exam gets to make up the rules, because the boys are given the order to take a nap and travel through both dreams and time to dive into a number of sleeping worlds which were destroyed by darkness. Once there, they are to use their keyblades to wake the worlds up, restoring them to their former glory. So the boys get to work. But as they do, they keep having these encounters with a strange young man who has both Xemnas and Xehanort's Heartless in tow. Because yep, turns out Xehanort's tampering with this Mark of Mastery exam too. And you know what, it's been a while. Let's take a look at the current state of the Xehanort Master Plan, TM. Plan A, you will recall, was to recreate the Keyblade by splitting Ventus into a Heart of Pure Light and a Heart of Pure Darkness and making those hearts fight. Almost worked, until it didn't. Plan B was to reforge the Keyblade by collecting the 20 fragments the original Keyblade had shattered into, 7 of Light and 13 of Darkness. Maleficent and Xehanort's Heartless had almost managed to collect the 7 Princesses of Heart, but then Sora barged in and scattered them all to the wind. As for the 13 pieces of darkness, that one had required a bit more creativity. For this, Xehanort had been planning to gather 13 vessels to act as hosts for fragments of his own heart, because he's just got, like, darkness to spare, I guess. It turns out, this is what Organization 13 had really been meant for. Xemnas had basically just been gaslighting the lot of them for years, telling them, oh yeah, you can totally get your hearts back if we can just create that Kingdom Hearts, go get hearts or something. But really, they were just 13 empty vessels being kept in one convenient group waiting to act as hosts for Xehanort. 
Unfortunately for Xehanort, most of those nobodies had turned out to either be insufficient for the task, or just too darn stubborn. But that's okay, because Xehanort here plays 10-dimensional chess, and he's got a backup backup plan. Plan C. Uh, let's see, we need seven pure lights, but you know what, forget princesses this time, keyblade wielders will probably work just fine. And those pesky keyboys seem really eager to just keep coming to him, so why not just let them take care of that part? Cool, okay, now for the 13 pure darknesses... Well, the organization plan was a bust, but that's just because all those nobody sucked. This time, Xehanort would find better hosts. Who? Well, if you want something done right, you do it yourself. So, through an incredibly complicated series of events, Xehanort has contacted a younger version of himself in the past and given himself the ability to travel through time and gather other past incarnations of himself, and a handful of willing vessels just to pad out the numbers. And this will be the real Organization 13. And he decides that, aha, the final member of this Organization 13 too will be Sora, just for the style points, I guess. And if those seven lights and 13 darknesses clash, bam! Keyblade, probably. So, Xehanort starts by sabotaging Sora's exam. He has one of his incarnations mark Sora with the recusant sigil, because apparently just putting an X in somebody's name or on their shirt functions as a tracking device in this universe. Bless this mess. Xehanort's crew eventually manages to trap Sora in the world that never was, and nearly succeed in turning him into the vessel for darkness they need. But Riku, Mickey, Donald, Goofy, and Axel, Lee, barge in and break things up. The real Oops All Xehanort's 13 disperses, and Riku uses his new awakening power to wake Sora back up. Back at base, Riku is declared to have passed the exam, finally concluding his six-game-long redemption arc. Yay! Sora fails, though. Aw. So Sora gets sent off to the Olympus Coliseum to go train some more. Riku goes and fetches Kairi so that she and Lee can start training to be Keyblade Masters themselves, and the story can maybe, maybe stop ignoring her. My prediction? It won't. And... I think that's everything? Ah, crap, we forgot Aqua. So Aqua's been wandering around aimlessly in the world of darkness this whole time, fighting off Heartless and being haunted by visions of her lost friends. And time is screwy down there, so who knows how long that time wandering has felt for her, but her grasp on hope is slowly eroding. She has been busy, though. She meets up with Mickey at one point. She actually helped to cover for him and Riku while they were closing the door to darkness in Kingdom Hearts 1. She meets up with Ansem the Wise and has some uplifting beach chats. And hopefully she's not gonna have to wait too much longer. Now that Riku is an official Keyblade Master, he and Mickey are about to head down and try to retrieve her. So that's basically where we are at. Xehanort currently has a bunch of his darknesses ready to go. Old Xehanort, Young Xehanort, Heartless Xehanort, Nobody Xehanort, Zigbar, Sykes, and presumably some others because that is not 13. And our heroes have, I think, five lights? Sora, Riku, Mickey, Kairi, and Lee. Maybe Aqua too, if Riku and Mickey can find her. Either way, I guess both sides are going to have to do some recruiting so we can have this 13 on 7 rumble. Now, you might ask why our heroes are voluntarily seeking to gather exactly seven lights for this battle when they know that that's precisely Xehanort's goal. Well, the game justifies it by saying that, hey, if we don't, Xehanort's just gonna go after the princesses. But the real answer to your question is, you choose to question the logic of this plot now? But who will the remaining pieces be? Where are the other revived organization members? Where did Lushu wind up, and what was in that dang box? Will the Dandelions and all of those Union Cross characters end up having any relevance at all to what's happening now? And will Tetsuya Nomura finally get over his bizarre commitment to clothing continuity? I couldn't tell you because I don't know yet. No spoilers, please. Now, if you have made it all the way to this point and you're still watching, I applaud you. And by now, you might have come to the conclusion that Kingdom Hearts' plot is actually stupid and bad. And you are absolutely correct. It is. <laughs> I mean, I love it, but this story is a bloated, convoluted mess. I skipped over tons of stuff to try to keep this summary focused and concise, and it still took me almost 40 minutes. I say this with genuine love for this series. The Kingdom Hearts plot is kind of bad, but that's the thing. None of us actually love it for its plot. All of this nonsense I just spouted off at you is only worth anything because it provides context for moments like this. And this. And this. And if you are the kind of person who is on board for that sort of sincere melodrama, then those moments can really be genuinely wonderful. Those moments are the actual reason people love this stuff. 
I am going to play Kingdom Hearts 3 for the first time on this channel starting tomorrow, and I would love it if you joined me. Subscribe if you want to come along on this ride. I'll see you tomorrow.